Hello and welcome to Simon's Rants. I'm Simon, and today I'll be ranting about George Lucas. Sorry in advance for ruining your childhood. So there's no need for introduction. Everybody knows who George Lucas is, right? He's the guy who came up with Star Wars. Well, kind of. He came up with parts of it, but there's these different theories about how much he actually did with the making of Star Wars. So my goal for today is to separate fact and myth of what George Lucas actually did and who else helped create Star Wars as we know it. Every script goes through multiple rewrites before it's ready to be filmed, but the changes that happened to these movies often happened during filming or during production at some point. Early versions of this film had C-3PO and R2-D2 being the main characters of the movie. In early versions of the poster we can see that C-3PO is actually the character in the front and in early concept art before they even had figured out half the characters C-3PO and R2-D2 are featured. While rewriting Star Wars George Lucas realized that he had to kill off a character on the Death Star and someone suggested to him that C-3PO get shot. But George Lucas refused, saying that these movies would begin and end with these droids. That these movies were about the droids. And that decision came well into the process of making this movie. Because by the time that was decided, Alec Guinness was already signed on to play Obi-Wan Kenobi. And was shocked that his character was suddenly cut from the second movie. That alone basically disproves all of George Lucas's claims that he knew where the story was going from the beginning and that he had 12 Star Wars movies written ahead of time. George Lucas has often claimed that he knew that Darth Vader was Luke's father well before any of the films were released, but I can prove that wrong right now. For starters, Darth Vader actually dies at the end of A New Hope. What? No he doesn't. He goes safely spinning off into space. WRONG! The characters early in the film go out of their way explaining that a little fighter like that can't survive in space on its own. A fighter that size couldn't get this deep into space on its own. It's like in episode 6 when Boba Fett falls into the pit. You know he's dead. You don't see it happen, but you know he's dead. They could have given an explanation to Empire Strikes Back that somebody saved him, but they don't even bother giving that. George Lucas simply brought back Darth Vader as a character because he was easily the most profitable character in the entire franchise. And on top of that, in the Empire Strikes Back script, there is no reveal whatsoever. Not only does it not say, no, I am your father, it doesn't say, no, anything. That conversation never took place in the script. It's just, Join me and we will be the most powerful. No! Okay. That's it. <laughs> this was clearly an idea George Lucas had while already filming the movie. While filming, that's not the line that they said. The actor who originally portrayed Darth Vader before the voiceover by James Earl Jones, his character actually said, No, Obi-Wan killed your father. Now, George Lucas has said that that was just a cover-up line, so nobody on set would know the plot twist until the actual reveal in the movie. But George Lucas has lied about so many other things about how much he knew ahead of time that I question that. After all that, you could still argue, well, obviously Darth Vader is still Luke's dad because his name was Dark Father, right? No. In the past two decades, George Lucas has been saying that he got the name Vader from the Dutch word for father. But it's not pronounced anything like that. It's pronounced more like Fatar, and I can't get a PDF version of it for you, but in the book The Making of the Empire Strikes Back, George Lucas has handwritten notes saying that he got the word Vader from the word Invader. He just took the I-N off the beginning of the word to mask the true purpose of the character, to invade places. If you think about it, that was his purpose in the first movie, simply to invade with the troops to take over a place. He did the same thing later with Darth Sidious. Darth Insidious. Real creative, George. Think outside the box on that one. It's also well documented that George Lucas had no talent writing whatsoever. In fact, all of his actors refused to say his lines. Alec Guinness, Harrison Ford, and Mark Hamill have all been vocal about the fact that George Lucas' lines were impossible to say and idiotic in their wording. And I did say, George, you can type this but you cannot say it. <laughs> Move your mouth while you're typing and see if you can say it. Now, Mark Hamill might not have been an established actor, and Harrison Ford was just getting his start, but Alec Guinness was a trained professional and knew what good writing looked like and what bad writing looked like. And he simply refused to say the lines the way they were scripted. And Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford followed his lead. But by the time of the prequel trilogy, George Lucas was kind of like the god of sci-fi movies. And everything that he said had to be done how he said it. So when Hayden Christensen, Natalie Portman, and Ewan McGregor got these lines, they had to just say them. 
That's why in the prequel trilogy we got terrible lines like I don't like sand. And in the original trilogy we got lines like I know. When the actors came across lines that they didn't like or felt were out of character, they simply wouldn't say them how they were written. It's also well known that George Lucas would actually write scenes on his way to the sets in Star Wars episodes 1, 2, and 3. Because of their use of blue screens, he didn't need to create sets, so he could just have blue screens set up and his characters walk around in a new environment that he just wrote for them. Half the time, they didn't even know what was going on. You blunder? Under. <laughs> this is ridiculous. This is just a mean joke. This isn't part of the movie look good. at all. So if George Lucas was really that clueless and talentless, then how did he possibly make such good movies in the 70s and 80s, and what happened between then and in the 90s and early 2000s when he made the prequel trilogy? That's where we come to the often forgotten hero of the Star Wars franchise, Marsha Lucas. Marsha Lucas is an acclaimed film editor who even worked for Martin Scorsese before George Lucas. She even helped in the writing process, one of her suggestions being that somebody had to die on the Death Star. Her real claim to fame though is that she edited around the movies completely so that they would make sense and actually flow. She had an emotional investment into the characters and helped the scenes to flow in a way that actually made sense to the viewer. I got stuck editing the end, end battle in Star Wars for many months <laughs> and we brought in two more wonderful editors. If there was anything that was dramatic or emotional, George gave it to Marsha. After The Empire Strikes Back, they got divorced. And that's where, honestly, the Star Wars movies started getting bad. It was slow at first, but the shadows of what were to come in the prequel trilogies were evident in Episode 6. We had the introduction of Ewoks, the kid-friendly characters there for the sole purpose of selling toys and getting kids interested. George Lucas has said later that the original idea for that planet was for it to be Kashyyyk, the planet of Wookiees. But he later changed his mind because it wasn't kid-friendly enough and because it wouldn't sell enough toys at McDonald's. Also in this movie, we're introduced to the new version of Han Solo, a lame shadow of what he was in the other movies. Probably partially due to the fact that Harrison Ford didn't want to be there, but probably also because of the writing. The core of Return of the Jedi is really Luke and Darth Vader, and they work well together, but other than them, there's really nothing going on. The same can be said for Revenge of the Sith. Other than Anakin and Obi-Wan's chemistry at the end of the movie, there's really nothing good in that movie at all. So after Marsha Lucas left George Lucas, we really never had a great Star Wars movie again. And we can't prove everything about George Lucas's inability to make good movies, but if he was really telling the truth about his involvement in the original trilogy, then why would the prequel trilogy end up so bad when he took out everybody else who supposedly made it good? If Marsha Lucas had been involved in the prequel trilogy, I can guarantee they would not have turned out like they did. George Lucas had some good ideas, it's true, but he definitely wasn't the mastermind behind Star Wars. There was a lot of people who had to help put together this movie, and he was one of the least important people involved. He just happened to be in the right place at the right time and cashed in on everybody else's talent. George Lucas hasn't even directed half of the Star Wars movies. And he's also even said that episode 5, which is widely considered the best one of the series, is his least favorite. If he was the person making these movies, then why would he think the best one is the worst one? Probably because that's the one he had the least involvement with. Marsha Lucas was still editing at that time, and he didn't even direct it. Irvin Kirshner did. So the best Star Wars movie George Lucas had almost nothing to do with, yet he gets all of the credit. Oh, he has no talent. I'm Simon from Simon's Rants, and that was my rant for today.